Hey folks, and welcome back to the video lectures for Philosophy 120, Critical Thinking, where we're going to dig into another logical system. We're still continuing looking at how arguments work, because that seems to be the theme for the entire class. But more specifically, we're looking at different ways that we can critically examine the arguments and the reasons and the positions that are offered to us by people everywhere. And so while last unit we started looking at categorical logic, a very old system that still does wonderful results today for analyzing relations between things and categories, we're going to start looking at a more modern system, one that is more widely used by logicians today. And while this isn't a logic class, well, we're not going to dive super deep into it. Learning the system of, all, of how propositional logic works will go a long way into showing us how we can understand how arguments fit together, how we can work with different sorts of statements, and how we can analyze things that our last system just can't quite cover. So in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to hit the introduction overview for what propositional logic is and how it works. And then we're going to spend the rest of the lecture hitting up a couple of the basic concepts that make the thing work. Namely, what the basic terms and symbols are, and how we write out and work with arguments in this system, and how we can start analyzing these for validity. Because, you know, depending on the system, we've got different tools available to us. This lecture is, I'm going to just straight up admit it, it's a lot of vocab and it's a lot of technical terminology. But if you take it slow, if you bear with me, I guarantee it's going to be very helpful compared to just making your way through the book. So we don't have a whole lot in the way of colorful illustrations or fun anecdotes, but it is, I think, a interesting and very useful topic to be aware of. You're taking your first steps into the wider world of logic, of pure logic. So... Speaking of logic, last unit, as I said, we looked at categorical logic, the system that's been around since Aristotle's day 2,500 years ago. And while you might have found it cool or useful in a lot of ways, because for one, it is, both for uber nerds like me and just because you, once you start trying to apply it, you find uses for it all over the place. You can catch sentences or syllogisms or arguments that use the same structures that Aristotle himself identified nearly 3,000 years ago. And while you may have found it cool or useful, you probably also found that it doesn't cover nearly everything. In fact, there's a lot of statements and a lot of just arguments that can't be expressed using the rules of categorical logic as we study them, which are the basic and classical rules that have been around, as I said, since Aristotle's time. It's still used today, but it's honestly mostly found in classrooms. It's something that's largely taught in either critical thinking courses like this one or in introductory logic courses to help show how logic and argument fit together, how we can critically think using formal systems with set rules and terminology to analyze arguments and ideas. And so what we're going to be doing instead is we're going to be looking at something called propositional logic. So where categorical logic handles the relations between categories or groups of things, we're going to be working with a system, this unit, that deals with formal relationships between statements and compounds of basic statements. So it doesn't have to do with concepts, necessarily. We're not looking at and uh, analyzing the connections between ideas or anything like that. Instead, we're looking at the formal, the structural, and the organizational relations between different statements. And so what we have is a system it allows us to look at the structure of an argument, at the structure of the things said, and draw valid conclusions based on that, based on the arguments and the reasons that have been said. So essentially we're continuing an examination to those G conditions for what constitutes a good ground for uh, believing the conclusion of an argument, but we can't forget the lessons that we learned on working with A and R conditions. Uh, having to work with the acceptability of premises and looking at how relevant they are to the conclusion. So we can't forget those past lessons, even though they might seem far removed from the stuff that we look at. So categorical logic used a few basic terms to construct its different types of statements. 
Categorical logic used all, no, some, and are to construct the four different statements, those A, E, I, and O statements. And it used those in different combinations with different categories of things. You could build each of the four statements just using the four words here and swapping in you know, even variables like letters in exchange for the categories you're working with. And you got statements like all men are monsters, some pigs are not a, nice animals, etc. Propositional logic has its own set of basic terms that it uses to build the statements and uh, the arguments that we analyze. Namely, it uses not, and, or, and if, and then as its basic terms. And it uses these to link together simple statements or propositions. That is, Pretty much any sentence can be swapped out for one of the terms we're going to be working with. And we link them together using these four terms here. And let me get my little laser dot so we can better see this. So instead of using all, no, some, and are, we'll use not, and, or, and if, then. And so using these, we can cover a much wider range of statements than you might imagine. We can translate most statements into this system of logic. It's far more flexible than what we worked with last time. But it's still worth keeping in mind there are some limits to it. Uh, for one, as I just said, this is a statement, a system that works with the formal relations between statements. We don't look at the content of the statements we're relating together, except to break them down into a very abstract form and analyze that. So this still isn't all of logic by far. <clears throat> also, the relations that we work with, you know, these different terms, not, and, or, and if, then, have very precise definitions. Just like with categorical logic, we define some in a particular way, you know, as being there is at least one X or whatever. Uh, just like we define some in a particular way, we're going to define each of these in a particular way. And it's actually going to be the bulk of this lecture, making sure we have these terms down correctly and specifying what we mean with them. On the one hand, that's because when we work with a formal system like this, we need to be as specific as possible or else the system just doesn't work. The whole point of it is to be specific and precise and to be able to clearly track the relations between ideas. But on the other hand, it also limits some of the things that we can do with it. Some of the terms we work with are very specific uses of these terms. And so there are some logical relations that can't be captured here. There are still more systems than this. And we'll look at at least a couple of them as we move throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, but for now, just being aware of that sort of stuff is enough. And we can move on to actually looking at the, the symbols and the terms that we use to do all this stuff. So first off, just like we did with the categorical logic, and you're going to hear that sentence a couple of times for these first few minutes, we can swap out a statement for a capital letter whenever we work out these things. So we're not just making massive paragraphs of text. So like if we have the statement, all men are mortal, we can just swap it out for the letter M, because that's a whole lot easier to work with. Uh, we can say Batman is awesome, we'll swap it out for a B, and so on. We can use any letter we like. Traditionally, we use capital letters just to keep things clear as to what's a variable, what's a symbol, and what's not. And we can use any letter we want so long as we don't repeat them within the same argument. We don't want to have two different M's that stand for different sentences or something like that. And traditionally, but you don't have to, uh, we use a letter that helps us keep track of that sentence. Because while we're looking at things in the abstract when we use all of this stuff, we do want it to actually help us in the real world. So you, having something that we can go back to and understand what it is we're saying does help quite a lot. Now, propos propositional logic is all about taking simple sentences, or even complex ones, and analyzing the relationships between them. So that means that we can modify and link together the different uh, variables we use for these. And we can use each of our different terms to do so. Excuse me, I jumped, got ahead of myself. So using our four terms, uh, not, or, and, and if then, 
we can join these things together and show the different relationships between them. First off, we're going to work with what's called the, de the denial or the contradictory, where we use the term not to just negate a sentence. And not, whenever we do the symbolic stuff you know, with the capital letters and whatnot, we can actually use a tilde, til, uh, tilde symbol, or your book uses a dash. Honestly, I prefer the tilde because it's easier to see, and at least with the books that I learned all of this stuff from, it's traditional. Whereas in some contexts, you'll see the dash, or even what looks like a little sideways L, the little like hooked dash. And so, for example, uh, when we use this stuff, the symbolic version of something we might see is this, the tilde M, which we read as not M. So we're just literally using this symbol to represent the word not. And this we're using to represent some sentence. Now, when we use the word not, like I said, we're using all these in technical and specific ways. The term not here forms the contradictory of the statement we're working with. That is, it's the statement that has the opposite truth value from the original. So it denies that original sentence. So like say if the sentence we're working with is B, Batman is awesome, not B become, is, stands for Batman is not awesome because that's the denial, the opposite of the original sentence. And because it's the contradictory that we're making, it has the opposite truth value. So if the original sentence, if the original term is false, not P is true. If it was true that Batman's awesome, then not B is false and vice, you know, and vice versa. And it's worth noting that you can put a not in front of another not and they do cancel out. So not not M has the same truth value as M. You're saying you're denying the denial of M. And so, yeah, not's rather straightforward. You stick a, a dash or a tilde in front of the sentence you're using, and it has the opposite truth value. You just literally deny the sentence. Yeah. Now, the other things start actually joining different sentences together. And is probably the next most straightforward term. And, as far as we use it, it's represented by a dot, joining two different terms together. And it joins these two statements together in what we call a conjunction. A conjunction is true if, if and only if both of the two things that make it, you know, that make it up, the two components, are true, what we call the conjuncts. So, and joins two sentences or terms together. And we basically treat that as a new separate statement. So the whole conjunction is something that we can treat as being a true or false sentence. So like if we're working with the sentence, Polly is pretty and Polly is sweet. This is the conjunction of two different statements. Polly is pretty and Polly is sweet. And we join them together with that and symbol right here in the middle. Now, once we've done that, we can take this new sentence, P and S, and treat it as its own sort of thing. We can say that P and S is true, or P and S is false. And it's only true when both of the two parts that make it up are also true. So P and S is only true if Polly is pretty is true, and Polly is sweet is true. And we can join anything together. Technically, while we don't do this in English very much, you know, we don't generally say very random things with the word and in between, we can totally do that in logic. So we can say the USA is the greatest nation on earth and Canada is cool. And it just becomes U and C. We might say that spiders are arachnids and a green is a color. And that's a perfectly valid conjunction. They don't have to have anything to do with each other. But the conjunction is only true if both of the state, if both of the components are true. So if either one is false, we treat the whole thing as false. And these are things to keep track of. These little details on when these are true and false, this is stuff that you do need to know. Now, or operates in a similar way to and. 
we represent or with a V symbol coming from the Latin word vel. And you might use either a very large one or a small one. I tend to use the small just because it's a lot easier to type. And we refer to or statements as a disjunction. So and con conjoins things. It brings it joins things together or with each other. A disjunction separates them in a sense. A disjunction is true if and only if at least one of the two component statements are true, if the two disjuncts are true. So if I say, Sophia is smart or beautiful, I'm essentially saying that at least one of these two is true. And we show this as S or B. <clears throat> and so long as one of those two is true, the whole thing is true. Now, usually, you, know, you, you can pretty much assume that in this class we mean this in the inclusive sense. That is, at least one of the two statements is true, but both of them could also be true. We literally mean at least one is true. In some instances, you might run into an exclusive or, and this is the same sort of thing, but instead of saying that at least one is true, it also says that not both of them are true. So if this were an exclusive or statement, Sophia is smart or beautiful, you have to pick one. Both of them can't be true. But usually there'll be some kind of a sign that you're working with an exclusive or. Um, in our case, usually we're going to be working in the inclusive sense. So if we mean exclusive, we'll slap on a conjunction on there as well and say, Sophia is smart or beautiful, and she can't be both smart and beautiful. And so there'll be some extra little thing on there. Or some other versions of propositional logic will have a separate symbol for the exclusive or as opposed to the inclusive or. It'll be like a V with a line under it or a V with a circle or so on. There are different ways of showing those. But generally, we're going to use this in the inclusive sense. So a disjunction or statement, true so long as at least one is true and possibly both. But so long as at least one of them is true, the whole thing's true. Now, our last major term is the if-then statement, what we call the conditional. And we represent this with a horseshoe symbol in between the two terms. And so the horseshoe goes in between the antecedent, that is the first term of the if-then, and the consequent, the second term. So if we've got something like, if the sun is shining, then it's a nice day. This is an if then statement that has a condition. If this first one's true, then the second one's also true. It's almost like a mini argument, but don't use premise and conclusion. That would be a mistake. So with this if then statement, we write it out as if s then n. And it's worth pointing out that perhaps even more so than the other things we've talked about, these conditionals have a very specific meaning used in logic. That if this first one is true, the conclusion is also true. They're true at the same time. But on its own, the, hor the horseshoe symbol type if-then does not mean any other sort of connections involved. It doesn't mean that, the, that one causes the other. It doesn't mean that one implies the other or anything else. All it says is that if this first one's true, the other one's also true. So they could have nothing to do with each other and just they happen to be true at the same time. And that makes the conditional true. You might say, well, if the moon's made of cheese, then Richard Nixon's president. So long as the right conditions are met, that can be a true conditional, even though it has they have nothing to do with each other. Uh, as far as the technical definitions go, uh, conditionals, whereas like with the other statements, we've looked at 
when are they true? You know, like or disjunctions are only true when at least one of the two parts is true. Conjunctions are only true when both of them are true, and so on. Conditionals are only false if the antecedent's true. Or excuse me, if the antecedent's yeah, if the antecedent is true and the consequent false, I was reading off the wrong line because I've known this stuff for years. Um, so yeah, conditional, only false when the antecedent is true and the conclusion is false. So basically, if you have a tiny invalid argument here, if you want to borrow the concept, this is not the right terminology to use, but if you have something like that going on, the conditional is false. It's worth noting that it is actually possible for both of these two statements to be true, or excuse me, for both of them to be false, and the whole conditional is true. Say, if unicorns are blue, then they'll look great at my party. It may be false that unicorns are blue, and it may turn out that they clash horribly at my party. But that doesn't make the conditional false, oddly enough, because of the very specific meaning we use when we work with this symbol. It's probably a little bit odd, but honestly, this is one that you probably just need to go with me on. When we talk about the conditional, we're using the very specific meaning of if the antecedent is true, the conclusion is also true. The fact that they're both false doesn't actually violate that. The only time that condition, the only time that that meaning is violated is when this one's true and this one's false. <clears throat> so long as that doesn't happen, the conditional is a true statement. Now, the last thing you need to know about the actual symbols themselves is that they can be grouped and combined together just like you would in math. That is, using parentheses and such. So like, where uh, in math you would use parentheses to group together you know different addition terms or however else uh, you know, however you wanted to write out your equations you just use parentheses and brackets you can do the exact same thing here in logic so like say if i wanted to build a more complex statement where i said if p or q is true then not r is true i can do it I can make a crazy complex sentence or statement here that goes all the way across the screen and the whole thing works. But to be clear, I need to put things in parentheses to show where all the symbols go with each other. Because if I didn't have the parentheses, you wouldn't really know whether it's P or if Q then not R, or whether you meant P or Q, then not R, you might wonder where. Uh, it basically, you just don't know which of these two symbols the Q would go with in this instance. So using, using parentheses is uh, just good practice to go with. It's a good best practice to keep in mind and keep going with. And don't worry, the examples that we go into are not going to be crazy complicated. You're probably not going to see anything much more complicated than this sentence right here out of all the homeworks. Because that's the sort of stuff that Intro to Logic goes into, and that's just not what this class is about. This is meant to be a basic and fairly quick look at propositional logic, so you can get used to how the thinking works, how the rules work, and so you can use it. But we're not worried that you get like full mastery over the system or anything like that. Now... We can get even more specific on our definitions for all this stuff if we start including what's called a truth table to lay out the definition of each term. And your book does this quite effectively. I'm not going to lay out truth tables for each of the different terms here on the lecture, simply because working with tables in Google Slides is a pain in the butt, and it takes a massive amount of time to get all the formatting right, and to get all the symbols inserted and everywhere. And truth tables get very large very quickly, depending on the sentences you're working with. So we only have a few examples of these. But in general, a truth table is a table that shows all of the possible truth values for a statement or an argument. And so what it does is it basically lets you chart out all the different combinations for what would be 
the truth value, if the term we're working with, if the sentence we're working with were true or false. And we can use this for one to show definitions of the various terms. Like for example, uh, when we looked at not at the start of all this, we laid out that not forms the contradictory of the term. That is, it denies the sentence and it has the opposite truth value. If I wanted to show that very precisely, say I want to show the definition of not like right here. So like I've got P, our basic sentence that we're working with. It doesn't matter what it is because everything's abstract and formal. That is, we're only worried about the structure. We've got P here and we've got not P here. And so if the original sentence were true, not P is false. If the original sentence were false, not P is true. And so the not symbol just makes it the reverse of whatever the original truth value was. And that's it. That's the technical formal definition. We can use the truth table to show that kind of thing. We could do the same thing with conjunctions. If I had had P and Q and then P and Q, we could have said, well, when P and Q are both true, the conjunction's also true. But if either one of them are false, then the whole thing's false. We can demonstrate those kind of definitions. Your textbook does a very nice job of this. It lays out a table for every term, and it walks you through it. Now, the far more important thing, the far more interesting thing, is we can use truth tables to actually test if an argument's valid, just like we used uh, Venn diagrams to show whether or not categorical arguments are valid. So just like with Venn diagrams, it's tedious, it takes up a lot of space, and it takes up a lot of time, but it can guarantee and it can visually show you whether an argument's valid or not valid. So like, take this argument right here, which is nice and straightforward. If P, then Q, not P, therefore not Q. You've seen this kind of argument all over the place. Uh, something like, if you vote for the Green Party, then we're going to fix government. Government will be fixed. You didn't vote for the Green Party, therefore the government's not fixed. You know, it's a blaming you type of argument in this case. But we can put whatever you want in there. It doesn't matter because we're analyzing the structure. If we want to see whether or not this is a valid argument, if you want to see whether or not that Green Party asshole is actually shaming you for a good reason, and I'm you know, exaggerating for effect. If any of you do vote green, more power to you. Be involved in the political process, please. But if you say one to check that, if you want to see whether or not it's a valid argument, you could do our previous stuff and you could see if you could come up with a counterexample and all that sort of thing. Or if you wanted to be really thorough, you could make a truth table. Because by spelling out all the possible combinations of true and false, you can see if there is a legitimate combination of things that makes the premises true and the conclusion false, is there an arrangement of truth values that makes that possible? If it is, if there is such a combination, if there's a line on the truth table where that's true, where that's the case, you have an invalid argument. And so your book generally lays out truth tables with T and F like this. But as soon as you start making very big ones, you start losing T and F in the midst of the other variables. So I'm going to use a trick out of another book and use a plus for true and a zero for false, just so we can more visually see what's going on and not get confused with a whole lot of letters. So let's look at this argument here real quickly. Now, with this argument, and I'm making sure I don't have, yeah, don't have any more elaboration on the next slide. So with this argument, we've got two premises, if P then Q, and we have not P. So we've got two sentences, two different terms going on. And so we need to make a column for each of those. And then we need to list all the different truth values for each of those. So P can be either true or false, and Q can be either true or false. And your book lays out the steps for drawing one of these in greater detail. So if you need the practice at it, don't worry. The homework and the readings will help you with this sort of thing. I'm just going through the, gen through the general points 
so you guys can get the big picture and better navigate the homework. Now, I've got the two different terms, <clears throat> P and Q. P and Q can each be true or false. And so I'm going to write out true and false for P and Q. And I arrange it this way just to help keep things straight, make it nice and even. Uh, the general rule for making a truth table is that however many number of terms you have going on, in this case we've got two, you need two to that power lines. So if we have two different terms, that's two to the second, so we need four rows. And for the first one, I do half of those as true, I do half of them as false, and then uh, for the next term, I did the same thing, but I cut them in half. If there'd been a third term and so on, this would have been four, then two, then one, and so on. Again, the book lays out this part of it more clearly, but... <sighs> Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I don't drown you guys in too much detail with all this. So we're analyzing the argument, we're making the truth table, I lay out the possible combinations of true and false for these two terms. They could both be true, P could be true and Q can be false, P can be false and Q can be true, or they can be both false. That fills all the combinations of true and false for these two statements. Both true, both false, one true and one false. That covers it, all of it. Then I look at the other statements involved. We have not P, not Q, and if P then Q. So each of those get their own row. Now, I don't list everything here because that's not really productive. And plus, they can't all be there at the same time in the argument. Remember, not P by definition has the opposite truth value of P. And same with not Q. And if P then Q is false, only if, in this case, P is true and Q is false. So basically, after I plug in all the combinations here for my terms, I basically work my way across the sheet and say, okay, so not P, that's the opposite of P here, so that gets a false. Not Q gets the opposite of Q, and P then Q. Well, these two are true, and so this is also true. All right, true, false. That gets a false, that gets a true, and here, if P then Q, that one's false when these two values are in place, and so on. And once I've filled out the whole thing, and I've worked my way across these, which is, can actually be kind of fun if you like very simple little problem-solving things. It's like a minor little puzzle. I like it more than Sudoku anyway. Uh, not that I do this very much, but it, I still think it's more fun. Um, once you've written all the stuff out, you look back to your argument. These are the premises, and this is the conclusion. I'm going to look for where the conclusion's false. Okay, so there's two rows where the conclusion's false, not Q. And so that's when those two are true. That's when that's like that. Now, with these two lines, the conclusion's false. Is there, you know, is one of these rows where the premises are both true? So my conclusion's not Q and it's false. That's good. I'm trying to see if there's a line where this is an invalid argument. So it's false. I look at one of the premises. Okay, so that's false. That's not going to work for me. An invalid argument has to have a false conclusion and true premises. That one's false, so that line is not my invalid argument line. So I only got one other option. Let's look. Not Q is false. Good. One of the premises is true, not P. The other premise is if P then Q, and that one's also true. So it looks like there is a line, this third line here, where both premises are true and the conclusion is false. Because it's possible, because there is a possible combination of values where the premises are both true and the conclusion is false, excuse me, this is an invalid argument. This is an argument that does not guarantee the truth of its conclusion deductively. So the truth table right there 
in full view of everyone can show me that it's an invalid argument. And it works every time. This literally works for every argument ever in propositional log logic. But it very quickly becomes a massive hassle. And I'll just officially say it's really damn tedious after a while. Because like I said, the number of terms you have, that's the exponent that gets applied to figuring out how many rows you have, just by the mathematics of how true, true and false combinations work out. So if you have three terms, that's two to the third, and so you have eight rows. If you have four terms, if you have P, Q, R, and S, just a mildly complicated argument, you have to fill out a truth table that is 16 rows long and is going to cover all of those different things. So it very quickly becomes massive. Truth tables always work 100% of the time, and they're hard to mess up. But they are not fast. They are not efficient. They are slow. It's the brute force way of figuring out valid and invalid arguments. So the two alternatives that are much, much faster and more effective, you know, they work just like the truth table one does. The two other alternatives are that you could analyze the argument and show that it's invalid or valid based on the rules of propositional logic, just like what we did with categorical logic. And we'll look at how this stuff works next time. Or you can do the short truth table version, where instead of doing a full truth table, you just do one line of it. Because remember, we're only looking for one line when we're, doing, when we're trying to prove if an argument's invalid. So all we have to do is fill out one line of a truth table that has one very specific combination. <coughs> Excuse me. And so to do the short method, you basically look for what you're trying to find, and then you work backwards. So remember, an invalid argument has to have a false conclusion and true premises. So let's assume that our conclusion is false. And then let's work backwards from there, just using basic problem solving skills. And if I can fill out the whole line and make it work, I have an invalid argument. Just for an example, let's go through this one. So here I've got an argument that I entirely just made up uh, in order to do all of this. P or Q. If P or Q, then not P and not Q. Therefore, not P and not Q. So this is just a random argument I threw together. It could have you know, real matchup in the real world, but we're just caring about the structure right now. It doesn't matter what stands, what P and Q stand for. They don't have to stand for anything right now. Let's assume that that conclusion is false. Not P and not Q is false. Okay. So this is an AND statement. And AND statements are only false if at least one of these two is false. So let's try out and see if we can make these work with one of them. It doesn't really matter which one's false to make the conjunction false. Only one of them has to be, and both of them could be. For all I know, it's just a whole pack of lies. But let's assume that not P is false for now, just because I want to work left to right. So I'm assuming the conclusion's false, and just as a matter of trial and error, let's assume this one's false. And so I'll plug in my false over here. If not P is false, I already automatically know that P is true, because these two have to have the opposite truth value. Um, I also know that this is going to change this line, my big, long, complicated one over here. Because if this is false, you know, if my conclusion is false, if I already plugged that one in, I have a false consequent here, but I know that P is true because I worked backwards from here to not P, and I got P. 
So I know that P is true on this little assumption trial and error bit here. So if P is true, that makes the this part also true because only one of these has to be true. So I've got one part here that's true. So this half's true. We're assuming that this one's false because that's what we're trying to get to. So I have a truth here and a false here, which makes this whole one false. Which starts screwing with my table here. Now all of a sudden I've got um, a true premise, a false premise, and a false conclusion. And I can work through the other combination. I can you know, go back to where I made my little assumption, assume that not Q is the false one. And it would change things, but not really. I'm going to still end up with the same result. Turns out this is a valid argument I threw together. It's an example of what's called modus ponens, a very basic valid argument form. So it turns out that I can't actually put together a line on this table that has true premises and a false conclusion. I can keep trying it, but I, I just can't do it. So in this case, this is actually a valid argument. I, I can't find a line on the truth table that makes things work out to be invalid. Now, I know that's all probably pretty quick because we went from defining the terms to determining whether an argument's valid or invalid very quickly. But the book goes a little bit more slowly and it's going to insist that you work on practice problems and you look through examples and things. And it also has uh, some far greater detail on how to translate English sentences into propositional logic. That is, it's got things to watch out for. It's got uh, lists of how different phrases translate over to English. Stuff that ends up just being very tedious and I end up reading the book to you. So I highly recommend that before you go any further, you do really start to work on those first couple of parts of the homework, uh, at least through this first chunk of the reading. Uh, I highly recommend it. The practice will do you a lot of good and it'll help you get the hang of the concepts that we're working with. Now, next time, we're going to talk about some basic proofs with this sort of logic, as well as some of the basic patterns that show up in our everyday reasoning. As we're going to name a couple of the like basic forms that we use for different things. And so we'll, yeah, we'll get some good practice in for actually doing proofs, determining whether other, you know, whether arguments are valid by another method, and just seeing what this stuff looks like in full practice, full use. Until then, though, do the readings, do the homework, get some practice in. Feel free to shoot me any questions you have. I'll be more than happy to answer them. And until then.